Are you a professional pillow fighter or a nine to five low cost time travel agent? Or maybe real estate sales on Mars is your profession. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is you do, however complex or intricate, Monday.com can help you organize, orchestrate, and make it more efficient. Monday.com is the one centralized platform for everything work-related. And with Monday.com, work is just easier. Monday.com, for whatever you run. Go to Monday.com to learn more. Well, I don't see the point in waiting any longer. So let's bring her out. The star attraction, the one you came to see, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Miss Judy Gold. So, uh, welcome to Kill Me Now. What episode are we? Five. Whatever, you're not allowed to talk. And we're here with Guy Branham. I love Guy Branham. Me too. Did I ask... I'm sorry, boss. If you liked Guy Branham. I'm sorry about that. And please ask before you speak. Yes, anyway, boss. Guy Branham, um, welcome. I love Judy Gold. Thank no, you for I having me. I love you. I love you. I love you. And this is Kill Me Now. And I'm a big Lauren fan as well now. Oh, no. thanks, Guy. Oh, yeah. um, Did you hear that? Oh, sorry. Anyway, Guy, uh, this is my podcast, Kill Me Now, which everyone has always told me to do a podcast, and I, I didn't do it. Uh, and I really like the format and I am always pissed off. So, yes. uh, it's, it's the perfect genre for me, but, uh, guy, we just did Larry and Wilmore together, yeah. which was really fun. You were way prepared. Um, and you know, you've done a lot of writing and, uh, you, that that article you wrote in the New York Times about Trevor Noah was fantastic. Thank I have you. to say, I really liked it, and I w- do want to talk about Twitter and social media and how it's affected comedy. Uh, where can people? Before we begin, where can people find you? On- um, people need to buy my album Effable on iTunes, uh, and also they can find me at Guy Branham on Twitter or at GuyBranham dot com. I love the cover of your new album. Oh. I heard a voice coming from <laughs> another studio that I'll check on that. Okay. Uh, congrats on the album. How's it selling? Thank you very much. It's selling reasonably well for okay. somebody who's not super famous. It was right. number one on iTunes for um, a while. That's good. Um, I, I brought you a copy, even though you are a you've listened to enough stand up comedy in your day. You know, I, the, but I I do. I mean, I love stand up. I love it. Uh, I can only listen to people I really... I know. But if I were Judy Gold, my response to the situation would be, hey, kid, that's cute. You want to know what? I've been through this. Like, I don't necessarily... No, I'm not like that at all. I am so not... Am I like that? No. Not at all. What the fuck was that? Oh, I... You asked. Yeah, but you did not sound sincere. Uh, no. All right, I'm done. I'm done with you. So anyway, guy, the reason we're having I a little I think you're like that when uh when um a young comic like won't admit that they're green or won't admit that they have somewhere to go or and and you're not a young comic. You've been around you you've you I mean, I've seen Oh, you I'm liking Lauren less now as well. I'm not a young comic. No, you're definitely not. No, no. No, no. Uh no, I'll just I, shoot I, myself no, in the head. I, th- what I yeah, the thing is the the um that Confidence based on nothingness yes. and the n- not ever working hard or that to me is like you got a lot to learn. But I um, e- ego with nothing behind it. Right. I don't like pe- I don't there's no ego. No one's better than anyone else. Just because, you know, it's this business is a lot of luck and it's you have to be prepared. I mean, if you're not prepared when your time comes or when an opportunity comes, then you're going to screw it up. So I'm, I mean, it is sort of like it's it's not the biggest thing, but I do sort of take some comfort in the fact that when this industry is really ready to come up and sling stuff at a 24 year old guy or a super hot girl who's barely done stand up comedy, like the likelihood of them fumbling that and then not getting a second chance is there. And that's always fun to watch. Right. And that <laughs> it does happen. And it's sad. And. I hope they learn their lesson. I mean, this is, you're in this for the marathon, not for the sprint. And people just, people cannot understand that. In LA, comedy is so full, stand up particularly, is so full of people who think that this is a, 
a short road to getting seen. Oh, it's a vehicle. Yeah. They use stand-up com. A lot of people, and you know what, in the 80s and early 90s, when uh, after Roseanne got a sitcom and everyone was getting, every comic was getting a sitcom, there were comics who literally, you know, put together eight, ten minutes. This is my show. What, it, you know, the, I we were just talking before about how I started on a dare. I was, uh, I think, 18 or 19. And uh, I st- and I went on the road. I couldn't even rent a car yet because um, I was too young. Uh, I couldn't drink in a lot of the places uh, I, you know, worked. I I was here before the social media, and here's my really funny Vine video, and now I have a billion followers. I mm-hmm. we had no cell phones, we had no internet. When we went on the road, it was like I carried my own coffee maker. <laughs> Um, Sometimes when I'm going to a college, I'll be like, how did they do this when it was maps? How on earth did they oh, do this? Oh, yeah. We, uh, maps, there was no GPS. There were no cell phones. It was, it was unbelievable. But you're 19 years old. Does it just feel like this is a fun thing to do or did you really just- Oh, no. Of- I, when, uh, I was a Secret Santa dear, right? So my Secret Santa had written me a note, um, you have to do 10 minutes of stand-up comedy and use everyone who lives on the floor as material. That's great. And- so, um, I really, it was like God had spoken to me. Seriously. It was like, oh my God, I took it so seriously. And yeah. then I went and when I did it, I mean, I was nervous, but when I went on the floor to do, it was in our lobby and every, we had a great floor. So everyone did like one girl, uh, they sang, they had a play, let it rain and everyone poured buckets of water <laughs> on her for each course. You know, it was like a bunch of crap. Uh, I had to one year, I had to walk, a, I had to crawl unless I was uh, outside um, with an apple on my head. So, um, and it was ridiculous. And then I ended up in that health center because I couldn't move my fucking neck. Anyway, that but, seems amazing for your core strength, though. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. Anyway, so the point is, is that it it really, when I did it, it was like an out-of-body experience. It was like, oh my God, this is what I'm meant to do. So did you say that Larry Ambrose was there the first time you did stand-up or the second time? uh, No, so the second time, I think I actually did it in a restaurant after that, whatever. But uh, they did a show at Rutgers, and um, Larry Ambrose, Bill Sheft, and Adrian Tulsh were coming to do a show. And uh, they... I guess the college was like, oh, we have a young comic. Could she do five, ten minutes? And I did, and they loved me. And I I mean, I just saw Bill a couple of – several weeks ago, and he's like, oh, my God, that face. I remember when you were 18 years <laughs> old, you know? So – and it was it was all about getting on stage, driving to the uh, – it was unbelievable. It was, you know, this social I, – I just – it. I feel like it has – sort of ruined in a lot of ways the the process maybe or all right so let's go back you right I want to understand what you mean though. I feel like these people think they can do a YouTube video and that's it they can go in a club and stand there for for an hour yeah. and entertain you can't it takes years it takes 10 15 years yeah. to know what the fuck you're doing on stage and these kids I I feel like this fucking iPhone, like it's driving me crazy. <laughs> like, first of all, this is my kill me now moment of the week. I have the iPhone 5S as in shit and it has no memory and I fucking hate it. Anyway, so whenever I hold it, you know, and I'm talking holding without headphones, my cheek hits the mute button mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I'm like, and then, and my mother's 92. Hello, hello, Judith, you know, and it's just, I fucking hate it. I was just talking to someone else, uh, uh, my lawyer on the way here. Hello, hello. I'm like, fuck, I fucking hate that fucking mute button. Did you just lower my mic? No, I just muted you. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up, guy. So guy. You wrote an article about Trevor Noah because his tweets. I should change my name to Guy and then no one will ever get my pronouns wrong. (laughs) Oh, you're going to spend a lot of time with people in Starbucks or third grade calling you gay, though. Uh Oh, they already do. How about how um, (laughs) it's not about you, Lauren. No, it's never about me. I'm sorry. Uh, You know, the uh, Starbucks people actually think my name is Jody or Julie. 
Do you know Aparna Nancherla? Who? Aparna Nancherla is a super funny comic. Yeah, uh-huh. Aparna. And we we wrote together a Totally Biased. And how much she just reached a place of not so not trying with Starbuckses, and she just tells them to say A. And you can tell that Aparna is at a place full of hope in her life when she actually says her name to a Starbucks. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, my wife Hemda just says uh, she's got her Starbucks name is Cindy. Yeah. Yeah, we should have people write in what their Starbucks names are. We should. We should start doing these shows live. <coughs> I know. How do we do that? Don't you think? Yeah, then we can get feedback and stuff. All we got to do is tell people. All right. Listen. So, Guy, you wrote this art. So, Trevor Noah is taking over Jon Stewart, yeah. right? And then he got in trouble for his tweets from years and years back. And you wrote this brilliant article, an op-ed in The Times, about the process and how you know, of becoming a comic and it's a lot of failure and it's a lot, not fail. I never think of it as failure because every time you get on stage, you learn something if you allow yourself. Right. To. And it's all about the stage time and, you know, developing bits, y- you got to go out there and, mm-hmm. and say things that are uncomfortable and risky. And then you realize, Oh God, that's racist or, Oh God, that's anti-Semitic or that's homophobic or, I don't because I'm none of those. But well, um, it's it's only racist I if it's am not funny. Talking to I'm God. sorry, boss. Continue. We Go. just we have no place for nuance in this, right? <clears throat> because at the same time that you do have to say stuff and you have to, if you want to make good comedy, if you want to make interesting comedy, you sort mm-hmm. of have to play with these big ideas. But there are a bunch of people who didn't think that much about what Lenny Bruce or Chris Rock or, or you know, other people were doing. And they just think, oh, rape, that's a nice big word that gets a reaction out right. of people. Oh, like... We all know that you, if you say the N word, then an audience is going to freeze up. But if you say faggot, the audience is going to like titter. And the thing is, well, it depends on the audience, number <clears throat> one. But yes, generally. Yeah. And you it, know. it like there's there's that and that's super tiring. But then there's also the game of you. People don't think about the fact that you can't do this in private. This is not like singing. Nobody's naturally good at this. I so frequently will have friends be like, oh, well, this person's not naturally funny or this person is naturally funny. And it kind of doesn't matter. What matters is what happens between your potential and seven years later, like what you're doing along the way. And it requires a lot of just figuring things out. And you you can't do that on your own. Well, the other thing is, is that. You know, it is all about – I tell people, it's all about stage time. You can sit and write on your computer. I used to say typewriter. <laughs> anyway, you could work, you know, write on your computer all day. But unless you go in front of an audience, you have no idea what's funny. And timing is is pertinent to it as well. But I never thought anyone was recording me right. or, you know, uh, videotaping me, you know, developing a bit and then putting it on – some social media thing and you know then you get in trouble and the thing is i don't want to live in a world where everyone's twitter feed has been vetted so that they can potentially be a supreme court justice one day right when i was an undergrad there was this one girl who was like always in her head she was like i'm gonna have confirmation hearings one day so like she wouldn't smoke pot she wouldn't do anything like her boyfriend kept trying to get her to have sex um in the laundry room and she was like no and it was like "Eh." a under the laundry room i don't know but like you check with me first go go yes we're now in a place where our president has done cocaine and you should understand that the world's going to move along but also that's just no way to live it's just no way to live and especially if you're a comedian like comedy would be really really boring if everybody was just saying things that were life affirming and didn't challenge or question what anyone believed well that's not comedy that's bullshit yes and it's so annoying to me that you know this country is turning into like you know we're just as religiously zealoty as these other countries these these right wing christians they're living in their own fucking world i don't need jesus fucking carrying the cross across here Yes, I don't know who that well, no, was. But there's she's some, very funny. I mean, it's it's just so hilarious that up until George Bush got elected, we kept talking about how everything needed to be all of our social services should be going through faith based organizations, and we should be funneling a bunch of funds there. Right. And then suddenly, everyone became scared of Islam, and then every penny that was ever donated to a mosque was suddenly potentially going to uh, to terrorists. And right. then, and Kansas was so worried about Sharia law being placed right. in like. 
And I was always like, is there going to come a day when they're going to pass one of those constitutional amendments in the Midwest that says remove like sh- Sharia law can never be our law and that has to remove their gay marriage ban and stuff like right, that? Right. The thing is, is that these people need someone to think for them. They are afraid of their own thoughts. So and afraid of of expanding their brains so that they can see other points of view. That's why I like being a Jew, because being a Jew is all like even your bar mitzvah or your bat mitzvah is about taking this passage that's been around for thousands of years and interpreting it your own way, you know, and we're taught to think of different sides of different, you know, I grew up in like the least Jewish place ever. We Wait, said- so you were in Yuba? Yes, Yuba City. Yuba City, California. So it's like a little almond farm, like an hour north of Sacramento, right. a very sort of like farming place. Right. But my mom's family are Jews from Arkansas. No, they're not. Yes, they are. You're Jewy? I'm- yes. Where's our bell? Our Jew bell. <laughs> there it is. All right. Guy, I'm so excited. It's very exciting. But I Did you get bar mitzvah? No. I mean Why? Because we were in the middle of nowhere. Who did, she married the Goy? She married a Goy. Like how Goya? Like, Goyish. Like Southern Baptist. Like everyone in my town is either like from Arkansas, Mexican, or from this one part of India. Okay. But like everyone I was related to <laughs> A little late, Lauren. Go like, ahead. Like everybody, everybody in town. I had a cousin who was 15 years younger than me who said like reckon when he was a child. Okay. Like it was that kind of place. So, but your mother's a Jew. Yes. And like ring. And being, okay. being, that means you're Jew. Being raised with a firm sense of the world, like the world doesn't work the same way for all people. Like right. somebody's getting basically her hitting me with a heart. Somebody's always getting screwed over. Figure out who's being screwed over. Um, well, they all hate us. And I grew up with that. <laughs> Judith, they hate us. Everyone. Ha- and you know what? She's right. They do. They all hate us. We get blamed for everything. We get kicked out. of everything. Meanwhile, look. Look at what we've contributed to the world, you know, in science, medicine, arts, fashion, literature, everything. Okay. Engineering. Fuck you. Then you hate us so much. Also, Jews are great in bed. I don't know (laughs) why nobody talks about Lauren, you look at me. I give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down and then you can talk. Yes, boss. Okay. So, um, and Jews are great in bed. A lot of... (laughs) A lot of they will they will come for us again. Like a lot of they but will I come for us again and again and again. <laughs> all right, that's not that fucking funny. Listen, but they are. Look at what's going on in Europe. Yeah, and here, the, in, even in California, and, yeah, and on college campuses. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Ms. Judy Gold. All right, anyway. So, um, all right. And are you. gives a new meaning to kill me now. I just got dark. Um, We're Jews, and you're not allowed. Anyway, so um Madam Mar- Free Speech I went have- that's not funny real quick, didn't yeah, she? Right. <laughs> Listen, I need to know yes. because I wa- I have I watched you on uh Keanu Bell's show. Yes. Are you really a football fan? Um That's Kamal Bell. <laughs> Kamal Bell. Uh, whatever. Shut up. Um How do you say his name again? Kamal. Kamal. Ring it. <laughs> Ring it. Uh- Okay. I played football in high school, and so I understand it better than I understand other sports. I don't really like sports. Like, there's no, like, there was one time when I was, like, very, very emotionally hurt by a boy, and I was at a bar, and I looked up, and I was able to, wa- like, watching something where you're invested, but there's not the same kind of emotional investment right. that there is in a story. Right. I kind of got it for a moment, mm. but mostly I'm just like, uh, it's not for okay, me. Okay, let me ask you a question. Yes. You played football in high school. Yes. All right. And you're gay. Yes. You're a gay. Yes. Okay. So, um, what, like, I need to know what happened in the locker rooms. Okay. Well, it was just the thing of, like, it's so funny when people get freaked out about trans people going into bathrooms Mm -hmm. because it's like, you shouldn't be scared of trans people. You should be scared of gay people going to the place that we're designated to go to. Right. As a 13 year old being dropped into a place full of very, very athletic, post-pubescent guys it was the scariest thing ever because i was like 
oh, Jesus Christ, they're going to figure – like it was super hot, but it was also like they're going to figure me out. Now, uh, did you look at the cocks – a lot. Oh, you, God, yes. So you were looking. Did you ever get caught looking at a cock? I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is I all, all guys look at each other's cocks is the thing. It's true. There were a couple of times and like we did. We did these like <laughs> pile up exercises oh, sorry, where, where we were supposed to like after whoever sacked the guy with the ball, we were all supposed to specifically pile and then stay on. I don't know why. But that meant it's so sexual that sport. I was laying on top of Bobby Cooper for oh, like Bobby Cooper five minutes, and I, I just like gently ran my hand up and down his stomach, and I can still remember that. And it was how so hard good. did you get? Oh, it was it was uh, it was. The Are worst. you getting a uh, uh, chubby right now? <laughs> just thinking about Bobby Co- Bradley, Bobby, Cooper. Bobby. They're very fond memories. But I was uh-huh. also so so psychologically broken that I like could not handle that in any way. Did, yeah. When did you come out to your parents? Uh, after I didn't come out to anyone until after my first year of law school, mm-hmm. uh, and I came out to my parents first, and then like after that, just tried to get it out there as as quickly as possible because everyone had been like. Every it was the terrible situation of everyone knew except for me. Right. And did you not know or you just didn't want to deal with it? Well, it's the interesting thing, and we need to talk about this because right. like female comedians coming out like well into life is a thing that fascinates me. The thing is, is as a gay guy, I knew it was making my dick hard when I was thirteen years old. Right. I just were like, gay people are disgusting. I'm not one of them. There's just something different that's wrong with me. And it mm-hmm. took like four years of Berkeley and a lot of like Shakespeare classes and chilling out and old Jewess is teaching me about Freud right. before I could sort of. I can't believe you're at Berkeley and you don't come out. And then I went to Minnesota. I, went I to... know. Minnesota. It was horrible. You know who went to Minnesota law school? Who? Karen Burgreen. Oh. I don't know her. Oh, she's so funny. She's a comic? Yes, so funny. Oh, that's she's crazy. She's written a bunch of, of books, too, that are hilarious. I have to find out about this um, because, like, the University of Minnesota Law School is a place where comedy goes to die. Oh, yeah. She went to Harvard and then University of Minnesota. Oh, that's real Minnesota. fancy. Oh, my God. Yeah. You guys in a room. She's great. Anyway, but. um, So I, the whole time was just sort of like. In and what year was this? Hard denial. So I came out in 1999. Okay. Um. But be- before that, like my my last year at Berkeley, I was writing for the campus paper. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, didn't you write something about Chelsea Clinton? Yes. And then the Secret Service came to your door? Yes. so Because it was a Stanford versus... It was like this, the Stanford-Berkeley game, and I needed to write something, and I was up against a deadline. So there had been like a big hullabaloo about how no one at Stanford was supposed to talk about her in the paper, and a guy got fired because of it. And I was like, oh, there are these like fancy rich people who are like blowing the president and telling him how great he is. Mm -hmm. We're just like regular scrappy Berkeley. No one fancy wants to go here. Like we should. But Berkeley's also doing the job of educating 40,000 people from like lower class backgrounds. And And it's such a good school. I was basically saying we should trash their campus. Like the only thing that really separates Berkeley from Stanford is prettiness of campus because it's like 6,000 rich people versus 40,000 poor people. Right. Um, but then I said that we should beat up Chelsea Clinton along the way. And, <laughs> um, and that was a joke. It was a joke. Uh-huh. Okay. What's terrible is I wrote in my column, Chelsea Clinton represents the Stanford ethos of establishment worship, which must be subverted and destroyed. Mm-hmm. The Associated Press quoted it as Chelsea Clinton dot, dot, dot must be destroyed. Uh-huh. Oh, I fucking hate that. <laughs> of you course know, they did. Uh, um, I react first and then you maybe can have a reaction. That, it's so fucking unbelievable. Like I – in um, when was it? I guess it was two thousand three or four. Four? It was two thousand four. That and sounds at, right. You're right, boss. I am at a uh, fundraiser for Howard Dean. He mm-hmm. was in the lead, and I really did not like George right. Bush. So um, I I'm doing stand up. Janine Garofalo's there. David Cross. It was like you know we're doing this fundraiser, and I say at the end of my Set. First, I opened up with my Dick Cheney, Mary Cheney joke, which was I had this joke about uh, 
Mary Cheney asked her mother if she could bring her girlfriend to the inauguration, and the mother said, you want your father to have another heart attack? <laughs> <laughs> Which was actually my mother playing a part of Lynn Cheney has never had that em- much emotion right, in the I entirety know. of her life. So I do that. And, you know, at the end, I was like, I was so stoked. I was did a great job. And I really want that. I wanted to. George W. Bush out. And so I said, just remember, we have to get that living, breathing piece of shit out of office. Okay. I mean, it was like, I got death threats of my, for my family. I had. Wait, you got death threats from your family? For my, like, don't, you know, sleep well tonight. And, you know, if anything happens to your kid, you know, I was like, oh my God, it's like ridiculous. How much have you paid attention to Gamergate? Gamer Gates? Yes. Are you at all aware of that? No. It was th- these girls who basically made some relatively innocuous comments about the place of women in the video game industry. Uh-huh. And then all of the nerds got together and started sending SWAT teams to their homes and figuring out where they lived. It's basically just like the best example of the disparity in violence threats that happen to women who say something versus men who say right, something. Right, right, right. Um, and it's terrifying. and these guys get away with like you think of all the politicians that cheated on their wives or been in these scandals and then you know rush fat fuck no kids for marriages a drug addict talking about Hillary Clinton you know, and her legs and her breath fuck you you fat piece of shit it just I don't get I don't understand where this shit comes from. All right. So you're – let's go back. So it's ni- it's 1999. It was just the thing of when I was at Berkeley in the campus paper, I said that I was not gay in my column. And the editorial board of the paper voted to disagree with me. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, you, uh, too your, much. Your heterosexuality was a typo. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, yes. I came out – in 99 mm-hmm. and it was terrifying and like it really was pushed along. What did your Jewish mother say? Um, my mom cried. Mm-hmm. She was very upset. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad said, what, did God make a mistake? And I said, no, you did. And my mom nice. honestly to this day kind of believes if my father had managed tag teaming the logic better, they could have talked me out of it. That's <laughs> she- so ridiculous. And not- how old How old is your are your parents? They are now 62 and 63. I don't get that. I don't, fa- my mother's 90 90- too. Yeah. Uh, I, I, what? I have a theory, okay, on on the the baby boomer generation and how conservative they are. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense because they were all hippies and like free love and and what mm-hmm. the hell, right? But at the end of the hippie generation, I mean, they were all strung out. You know, kind of destitute, probably didn't have like, you know, they were like tired, tired of all the drugs and all the shit. AIDS was starting to, you know, there were sexual diseases. Get to the fucking point. So then the Christian movement comes along, picks them up, gives them water, says, we love you. They're still coming down off of acid thinking they're seeing Jesus and they get swept up in that. No, I know. Well, look, Duggar had a friggin' abortion before, you know. Really? Yeah, I think she, look that up, please. Lauren. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think, she, yeah, she either had an abortion, definitely had premarital Whatever sex. you think of those people. Are you talking about the little girl dugger or the mom dugger? The mom dugger. Whatever you say about those people, that's a resilient uterus. Like, that's a, re- that's a uterus that's I, been yes, through a lot. But they are horrible people. Yes. And, you know, the ones that head of the family research, anti-gay, gay, gay, and gay, gay, gay. You're fucking 20 whatever years old. And one of those kids is gay. The statistics that 19 kids out of 19, how many, there's got to be two and a half kids that are gay. I hate the the self-righteousness of shiny normal people always makes me want to stab them. Because you're always going to find out the terrible thing or just the the not. But also the, we love you, the patronizing. Yes. But we love you and we're all sinners. I'm not a fucking sinner. But listen, here's my logic on my mom. I am probably. Here's my logic on my mom. (laughs) She just in a very... I mean, it's like we're cross-pollinating Jewish mom mm-hmm. with mom of loving gay son. So she really thought my place in this world was just to obey her, like just to be the man that she could never be, like go out there and do impressive things so she could brag about it at Target to other ladies. Right. And this, she just, like she didn't understand so what. So she's a Jew that goes to Target. <laughs> So she's not really Jewish. She's not really Jewish. I mean, she Jewish. goes to Target. What does she buy? She doesn't buy clothes at Target, she does doesn't, she? 
Target has good clothes. Okay, so she's not full Jew. Okay, <laughs> ring that bell. Ring the bell. Okay. Um, she does ex- spend a lot of time explaining me how she paid less for the things at Target than she should have. I can't see if uh, a Duggar and abortion, but they definitely compared abortion. Just a Duggar compared abortions to the Holocaust. Unfortunately, yeah. a lot of them taste like chalk. And Thankfully, I found Crest Sensi Relief. It actually oh, wow. tastes good. I have, and no. relieves. That's no. because you went on a link Idea. and a commercial came on. That's what no, happened. Look at the Duggar, you know, Jim Bob and and whatever the fuck her name is. Okay. They're so unattractive too. The fact that they fuck all the time is so that annoying. Hair. That hair. That hair from the eighteen nineties yeah. gold rush. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Miss Judy Gold. Listen, okay. you, all right, go. So you tell me, Uh huh. there are so many ladies who... I love that you say lady. I'm sorry. No, I love that. Um, no one calls me a lady. There are so many... She's a lady. Oh, whoa, wait, we're on... Whoa, whoa. We may not be able to sing that because we're on CBS and, you know, they have to get the rights. All right, go. <laughs> Comics of the 80s and 90s, the number of women who came out after 35 is, like, pretty significant. And, like... I feel like lesbians are better at talking around things than than gay men are. Not you, Judy, but most of them. Um, basically, it's like, when did you understand that you were gay? Like, when did you... So I always knew there was something different. Like, uh-huh. from the time I was three, I'm like, I'm not like them. I remember when we moved uh, to our house in New Jersey. We lived in an apartment, then we moved to the house. And I remember I would... I knew that I would get crushes on girls and not guys. And it wasn't until, you know, until I was an adolescent and um, you become sexual. It was the, the complete natural process of a nor- of like a straight yeah. heterosexual person. Well, I always just wonder about these people who say, because like Wanda's pretty forward about saying like, no, I understood that this was a thing. I just didn't really go after it oh, until no, later. I, I, but the people who say that like, I was 35 before I figured it out. Yeah, that to me is ridiculous. I always, I question that. Now, yeah. I always knew. And... You know, I never talked about it on stage until I had kids because I really had nothing to say. Yeah. I was in a relationship. I was a comic on the road. What was I going to say? I'm in a relationship. Like, was there were no, there was no material. Well, there's the twin thing of like it, just being a woman fighting through the system on its own right. had to have been super hard. But then there's also the weird way that like there weren't that. M- <laughs> There weren't that many gay comedians who managed to succeed in the generations before me. And it's very hard to see, like, the butch lesbians in San Francisco who have been doing this for 20 years and nobody ever had a need for them. Or the people who sort of, like, you know, it's like, I know who Bob White is. Nobody else in comedy knows who Bob White is. Do you know Bob Smith? He's Bob Smith. That's what I'm thinking of. Openly Bob. Okay, so Bob Smith is my best friend. Oh, really? Yes. And we actually own a house together. Anyway, Bob Smith... Um, is the greatest. I mean, I remember in the mid eighties at Comedy U Grand. This is before you were born. <laughs> um, in the mid eighties. By the way, November twelfth, uh-huh. November fifteenth. Okay, <laughs> that's our birthday. Don't talk. Anyway, um, I remember. I became friends with Bob because he was part of Funny Gay Males. Yeah. And uh, at Comedy U, he would just get on stage and he would say, uh. In the middle of his act, uh, um, I told my parents I was gay. Like in the just that was it. And yeah. it wa- and you know he went through a lot of shit, but he didn't care. And he's so smart. He was the first uh, uh, out on the, Tonight Show. on the Tonight Show. His HBO special is great. Mm-hmm. Um, he has ALS now. He can't speak anymore. But um, he's like still smile on his face, and he is. You know, for me, I was like, I love this guy. I mean, he is fearless and non-threatening and Very smart. Very handsome, too. I know. But, you know, I – and I would perform in Provincetown, and I was – I wasn't in. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have anything to say. And then when I had kids in 96, when Henry was born, I was like, I have so much material. Which is also real early on the curve. Like, right. it's real early on the curve. That's – that's before Ellen, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but I was doing it in the club. She did it, you know. Yeah. But the thing is, like, we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago about how 
you know, these people are, are famous. They got all their money. By the way, I'm now going to come out. And right. it's like, I couldn't, I could not live with myself. Like, first yeah. of all, what kind of message is that to my kids? Right. Listen, um, we're a gay family. I'm going to fight for our rights, but on stage, you know, you just can't. Like, yeah. there's something wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. That's all. And I have, sorry. I'm not a rant. Yes, yes, miss. And I, there, it's just this, this constant, you know, look, I, I am a comic and I happen to be gay. I mean, I made it through the whole, you know, 80s boom and 90s boom doing my act. And I, I never talked about like girly, you know, it, yeah. but it doesn't matter, you know, but when I became a mother, every comic talks about their family. So right. I'm going to talk about my family. So I kind of essentially came out as a lesbian mom. Uh-huh. So, which has another layer to it. Uh, and yeah, Ellen came out, but, but we're talking about things that make us angry. Here's right? the thing. Here's the thing. When people are like, Oh, I don't want to come out because that's all they'll see me as or whatever. Like that's th- your own fucking paranoia. Th- well, and also that's not my fucking problem. Right. If, it, if that's, if that's all an audience can do, that's their fucking problem. And why don't I tell good enough jokes that they're going to want to come along with me? Right. And like, God knows for a long time, there were a lot of people who kind of weren't able to see past that, you know, weren't able to see past that fat gay guy yelling. And that's them. That's not me. I was doing good work. And- right. If you were straight and yelling, you'd just be a fat straight guy. Yes. But the thing is, is were you always fat, by the way? Yes. I can, always. I can still wear. I have a couple of shirts from when I was in eighth grade. And I can, that you can still wear? Yes. Did you get teased all the time? Yes. Me um, too. I got called Bigfoot and Sasquatch and Orca every fucking day of my life. The thing is, I only really got bothered for being faggoty, really. Like, I only really... Wow. It's so funny. In, like, third grade, we had this thing where Mrs. Sanger was talking to everybody about having... Needed- She's Jewish, Mrs. Sanger. No, no, no. All right, go. Um, but she could go back in <laughs> on Ancestry.com, and I'm sure there's a fucking Jew in Somebody, somebody fled Jewish. something. Yeah. The amount of time as a child my mom spent preparing us for when we were going to have to flay. <laughs> but um, it like, but it was like everybody was calling me gay guy or saying that I was weird or just trying to right. figure that out. And she was like... Queer. They were looking for queer. Stop teasing. Stop teasing guy for being big. And it's like nobody was really teasing me for being big. Right. I, uh, I was six feet at 13 and I'm in New Jersey. Yeah. Welcome to the Dollhouse. Do you remember that movie? Yes. That's like my child. My yeah. ex. Uh, I my know ex- your ex. Is the uh, what's her name? You Heather. dated Heather Matarazzo? Yes, for years. Fancy. Yeah. Also, you Fancy. Get, you got a type. <laughs> I I have a type. Like Jewy and big hair. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you know, she's true. not Jewish. She's Italian. She's Italian. Oh. Actually, no, she's Irish. Hundred percent Black Irish. Well, her last name is Matarazzo. I assume she was there's... adopted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anyway, but I did do... you look up the Duggar information I'm looking for? I like women that look like they could be cast in the craft. Unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, I can't find anything about her having an abortion. Not just, just do the premarital sex. Just look Duggar pre- premarital sex and then we'll end that. You got it. So anyway, I'm having a very intensely loving – I love this guy, Guy Branham. Anyway. Um, Judy Gold, you fucking stop that. This is – too wonderful. I watched you so much when I was starting you out. You did? I was so excited. When I realized that you were on All American Girl, I was just like, like I was like, this is going to be the best show ever. And it was, it was a sophomore in college, <laughs> and I didn't watch that much TV, but I specifically was at home every Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever it was. It was on Tuesday night. Uh, to watch it, and when it got canceled, I was torn the fuck they, you apart. Can get, did you see the, la- the episode where I was naked? No. <laughs> oh, we will all move in together, and I walk around the house naked all the time. I mean, I'm sure I saw it. <laughs> and I was pixelated, but that, and then like her whole family comes over. I'm like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> um, and then the, the younger brother kept saying, can we go see Gloria? Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was, it's, I I, thank you for that because, uh, you know, I tell Lauren a lot of, uh, I've uh, on line and, and I've helped, I've dealt with a lot of kids who were, are having issues anonymously. I don't talk about it at all, but there have been kids that I, you know, reached out to me and, are now grown up. One was born a woman and is, uh, is was born female and is now male. And, you know, it's just so great to be able to put on uh, the TV and see some outspoken, you, you know. Do you want to hear the best fucking story ever? Yes, the fucking best. Okay. 
I was in I was in San Francisco for Sketchfest, and mm-hmm. I basically had two interactions over the course of an evening. One with sort of like an out gay comic who was just from that generation before me who were so scar ridden mm-hmm. by all of the rejection that mm-hmm. he was kind of a dick to me the whole way up and just mm-hmm. sort of didn't deal with me. So I had right. that interaction and then I had an interaction with a guy who came out of the closet not that long ago and is still not so great about being around other gay people. Right. Uh, and I was just in very much this place of there's no fucking place for me in this. Why do I do this? Blah, blah, blah. And then there was this gorgeous, gorgeous boy in the corner making s'mores for us. And um, <laughs> M- Michael McKeon or whatever his name was mm-hmm. from. Uh, no, the one from Mad TV. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, that one has always been lo- lovely to okay, me. Okay, because I love him. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I was just trying to figure out who it is, and I <laughs> I put wrote it down. Oh, uh, Judy and Guy had a uh, little uh, note passing all right, session go ahead. for those listeners Point listening is, over audio. I went up to a podcast. I went up to this boy to find out whether he was gay or not for one of the other gay comedians there, and before I had a chance to say anything, he was like, "Oh my God, you're Guy Branham," and I was like, "Yeah," and he was like. When I was basically was like when I was back in Little Rock, Mm -hmm. seeing you on TV was like one of the first things that let me know it was okay to be gay. And I was like, first of all, doesn't that isn't that make it all worth it? Made me feel old. Like, (laughs) but no, it was it was so completely worth it. It was so completely. How many people come up to me and they're like, my grandmother loves you right? or my mother loves you. I'm like, fuck, what about you? Oh, I love you, too. (laughs) But yeah, it's 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 so important. Like I. I never, I don't, I, this really is like the most passionate thing I could speak about. (laughs) That's why she can't speak. What? Thank you. Uh, I, you are born, like I tell, I just spoke at this, you know, um, GLBTQ for um, high school kids, Pride Works. And I said, you didn't ask to be born. You were born this way. And you're not responsible for your parents' happiness, for any – your pastor's happiness, your – whatever. You're responsible for being who you are and being proud of who you are and living a great life. You know, it's like so many people feel like, oh, I'm such – like I have this whole theory about – and it's definitely for my generation, the gay available child. So it's always like when the parents get sick in my generation, it's the gay kid that takes – care yeah. and is the one because they feel guilty to make up. I'm so sorry. I, right. you know, disappointed you. Fuck that. The gay kid is the one that I have to say, I feel like I'm favored. Don't you think a little <laughs> bit on the favorite? Oh yeah. All right. But it's, it's just this, you know, when people say, Oh, well we got like, you know, who cares about gay marriage? We have like, we had a commitment ceremony. No, it's, we're not fucking equal. Do you fucking understand? I pay my taxes. I contribute to this world. I, fuck you. You're not going to treat me equally. Well, A, I think that Jewiness just gives you such nice rails to get on right. for a sense of civil rightsiness and sort of like, no, right. let's, let's, let's do this. Right. But then there's also the thing of like, it's so easy for gay people in a city to take this attitude of uh, who's going to Indiana anyway, who's getting a pizza at their wedding there. Well, a when you're starting out as a gay comic and you're hosting Vallejo pride or whatever, right. you see who's getting a pizza at their wedding right. and you realize they're the ones who need rights. Right. But then there's also just the thing of like, we don't oh, <laughs> like oh, we, we don't. My mic's on. We don't get born to gay parents. We're back. We, we don't get born in gay neighborhoods. We, uh, like there are little kids in Indiana who are having to figure this shit out, and we have no one to talk to. We need to yeah. do everything we can to make sure that we they don't kill themselves. I always say we're the only minority with the good taste to kill ourselves. Right. We don't. Yeah. We, we don't kill other people. <laughs> well, also we don't wait for a police officer to come along right. and do it. We just solve the problem ourselves. So mom has nothing to clean up. It's just unbelievable that you can have a child and i mean because i have children so i know and just reject the child you know for being someone if you i asked this one woman after one, uh, my show 25 questions for a jewish mother and i said uh she's like well you know i really couldn't deal uh with that i said would you rather have your child marry a black guy or a, be with a jewish woman and she said uh 
oh god I, and it was the black guy it was like because he has a penis you know yeah it's get it's, <laughs> what it's just ridiculous how important our peepees are it's like stop being so obsessed with our peepees but it's just man. this Get whole it. like we it's who you love and you're saying to my kid my kids have no idea why we our family wouldn't be as valid why i couldn't visit uh, my partner, you know, in one of these states in the in the ICU. He- I Heather mean, it's couldn't just, visit me in the hospital when I was. It there. was. It's beyond the two mom stats are the best thing ever. You have a child with two gay dads; they're just as fine as any other child. You have a child with two moms; they don't die. Like they just don't get. But like the there's thing so is, much is healthier. that there's zero percent um, domestic violence in uh, g- gay. Par- look that up. But I think it's a, 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 like minus. Okay, my last year at Berkeley, we spent a lot of time talking about lesbian domestic violence. Like there no, was no. For, oh no, lesbians kids. beat oh. the shit out of each other. No, I mean towards the kids. Yeah. Like, so do uh, gay men. Uh, yeah, but it's hot. Um, <laughs> um, my like it's my mom won't like sh- they'll watch me on the TV with the sound off. Like they. They're excited that things are happening for me. It just so bothers them to them that it's tied up well, this with one is, of their great shames. Right. But it's that that's their problem. That's what these people don't understand. It's and, not your problem. It's their problem. And, like my mother's like, uh, you know, why can't you be like Ellen? She doesn't talk about it all the time. I'm like, I don't talk about it all the time. But that's who I am. I'm not going to fucking not talk but about it's also, it. Also, what's interesting about that is – these ladies who honestly taught us to be pushy and taught us like we to go for what you want. And yes. yeah. And also who vented all of their emotions at us are somehow expecting us to not. Be- oh, right. To be repressed. Yes. It's like my mother. If if the gas station attendant like dripped a little gas on the she'd be writing a letter and calling the head of Exxon like my, that. My right. mother was like this, like a, an advocate, you know, for herself, like a, a consumer advocate. And was always, oh, I'm, get-. you know, my, I got a review, 25 questions for a Jewish mother. I, we got a rave in the time. It was uh-huh. a very well reviewed, yeah. very successful show. And we went on the road for three years. And the Star Ledger, which is my hometown paper from uh-huh. New Jersey, the guy gave me a terrible review. And I'm at a media thing. And the Candy, her name was, was doing press for the show. And she's like, Judy, I need to talk to you. And, and I'm like doing some kind of radio show. She's like, I really need to talk to you. I just got, um, I just got a call from the guy who wrote the bad review uh, that uh, there's a message from your mother uh, on his answering machine, uh, and he wants she wants him uh, to call her back. He's not going to call her back. He's not going to call her back, and you can't have your mother. So of course I was like, oh god, it's embarrassing. And then I call my mother. She's like. I can't call him. First of all, it has his phone number in the uh, review at the bottom, and he has an, his opinion, and I have mine. So if I have to listen to his opinion, he couldn't listen to my, I mean, it was, and it made so much sense. And yeah. I was like, that's why I love my mother. But she yeah. fucking called the reviewer to tell him what an <laughs> asshole he is. And then when my next one woman show, The Judy Show, he actually gave me a, a decent review. Um, but, you know, it said something about, you know, my mother. There's something beautiful about the world that you come from never really getting you. Right. That I think is lovely. And also to your point about, I think that there, if you can do the work of figuring yourself out, figure, coming out of the closet is so valuable. Because having that breaking point. Well, that's what Harvey Milk said. And real, Yeah. Because then everyone will realize, oh, my God, my best friend's gay. Oh, my God, my dry cleaner's gay. But, my bus driver's But gay. also but, internally, yeah. internally realizing – Oh, I'm not living for them. I'm, I'm not living for me. Yeah, yeah. And like when you accept that the structures of the world around you don't necessarily work for you, you can pick the ones that do work for right. you. You know? And also this whole uh caring about what other people think. Like like Elisa, my partner, who I mm-hmm. love. Um you know, I'll say something, we'll be in a, out to dinner and I'll say, Oh, and Elisa and I had a fight about blank and then we'll leave. Now they think we fight all the time. I said First of all, I don't care if they think that. And second of all, they don't. And all people think about is is themselves. That's all they fucking give a shit about. Well, also, you said earlier you said you wanted to talk about social media. And I think the best thing about social media is getting everybody a lot more chill with being honest so that we can all be honest and not have to pretend that we're these people who don't fight or, you know. But it's also like it gives a platform to people who do not deserve a platform. Uh huh. It also is – uh, this is what I f- – and I really find this sad. So I'm watching TV. That new fucking iWatch or Apple Watch uh-huh. is coming out. 
And there's a guy at the end of this commercial. I said this to Elisa last night. Like the end of the commercial, there's the guy is laying in bed and he's reading, and he his watch uh, makes a noise and it's a heart pitter pattering, and he's like, "Ugh, like someone loves me." You need a fucking watch with a heart icon. What about calling the person and saying, I love you? You know, yeah. like there's no it's unbelievable. The lack of interaction like I have talk about how I used to get stoned and go to Tower Records and sit there four hours looking through albums. No one bothered me. I had thoughts. They stayed in my head or I wrote. I mean, it's just it's we are now having a. A, oh, they, they also tell you when you have to get up and walk around. Yeah. You know, it's like we now have a computer telling us, oh, it's time to get up and walk around. Just what the fuck yeah. happened? I do worry. Yeah. I do worry about people losing the capacity to think for themselves. The Uber driver who brought me over here just couldn't do anything but do exactly what the GPS was telling him. That's to. what I did. I told him no. And then, of course, I realized the GPS was wrong. But anyway, I did Waze. Do you do Waze? Uh, I, no, I don't. Waze is a really good GPS because it gets it's real time and it gets you out of traffic. Like if you're in the car, if yeah. you're a Wazer, uh-huh. uh, you can say, oh, there's a lot of traffic. To, you know, and then, it, all right, whatever. Go. Integrating traffic knowledge is extremely important to yes. figuring out routes in Los Angeles. Yes. Here. I used to look at the Thomas Guide. Did you read the article about the Thomas Guide in the New York Times a few weeks no. ago? Uh, so in the magazine, they had a th- – now, when I went to L.A. in uh, – I got – it was 91. I got a uh, guest spot on Roseanne, and I started doing Mitzi Shore uh-huh. in the belly room upstairs, gave me every Friday night. Oh, that's awesome. And I had my own show, and I really developed material for my HBO special where I won the Cable Ace Award. <laughs> anyway, but um, – you know, and I always got on stage. I'm one of these people. You can ask Lauren. I work fucking 24 hours a day. But the thing is, is that you couldn't get anywhere without the Thomas Guide. And people would – and it was this huge book and it had every street and every – you know. And people would say, oh, I'm on page 42, <laughs> G4, you know. And that's how – you could not get around – L.A. without this Thomas Guide. Oh, that's so funny. And this guy talked about the Thomas Guide and how – that was your intro to LA. It's like the MTA, like the subway system here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now it's like turn right. And it's like I realize now I, after using the Thomas Guide, of course, really learned east, west, north, south, navigating the streets. But now with this fucking thing going, make you don't even think about where you are. No one thinks like the arts are so I just can't like. That's what the government wants. Okay. So we can become more malleable. No, it's true. I just I feel like nature. I feel like I went to a couple of years ago. We went to Paris for my fiftieth, and I purposely did not get a phone plan. Yeah, I, I it was amazing, and I remember that. You know, I remember most of my life I have not had a cell phone. You know, yeah, or the internet. I mean, I, I hear about people who just sort of like take a week off or whatever, and I'm envious of that, but it is that comic thing of I feel like I should always be working, so right. you always want to have the tools to be able to do the work Right, that but that's why I have 70,000 notebooks. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's... But it's also social media work. It's also, I have... Right. It's know, like, oh, you got to go on Twitter, and yo, you got to go yes. on this, and the Vine, and the Instagram, and the, and I'm just like... I just want to read and think, Uh you know, and then write an article or get on stage. And it's like, unless you keep up this fucking constant, I feel like the anxiety level, the ADHD, like I, you have to, this stuff definitely affects your brains. Absolutely. What's so fascinating is just from an evolutionary perspective, how how limited an amount of time it is that this has been going on right and sort of understanding things that like well when you're talking with someone over skype like i'm sure that there are chemicals that aren't activating that you get from being around someone or or those therapists that do you know so many therapists do facetime and skype phone therapy is the worst i did oh wait i have the best phone therapy story okay so when i lived in la uh i went to this therapist Uh uh-huh Helene Green. And she wore really big shoulder pads and had these big glasses. Anyway, and you could totally see her clock that uh-huh. she used to stare at. Anyway, you know, to tell you, time to yes. wrap up. So I go back to New York, right? 
and um, I'm doing phone therapy with her, uh-huh. right? And I don't remember when my appointment was, but I had this, you know, standard appointment. So um, I call, no answer. I call, no answer. She calls and says, listen, Judy, I'm having a problem with the phone. I'm going to call you right back on my other line. Uh-huh. She calls me back. We start therapy. All of a sudden, I hear horns beeping. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm like, you're fucking driving in your car? She was driving. <laughs> and this is how shitty, I, stupid I am. I kept her for a few more weeks because it was so hard for me to say. Like, Judy, my- Judy, how did you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let me tell you, my my clean. There's, I have a woman, Joy, who's come to me for years, and she cleans my apartment every other week. Okay, today she says to me, "Not kidding." First of all, she cleans everything with palm olive. She said it cuts the grease. It's like my floor is palm olive. Well, that's what so, it says on the bottle. So anyway, today um, I had bought. Um, what is that? Uh, not scrubbing bubbles, but the other one. Uh, you know, uh, 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 whatever. It's one of those fan- cl- yes. cleaners. Fantastic. But it's got a thing on it that looks like bubble. Anyway, so. Mr. Bubble? Shut up! Yes, miss. So anyway, sorry. Can we get I'm a sorry. new mic? So, um, so anyway, so she is, uh, today she says to me, listen, and I have two bottles of this cleanser, which is like a general yeah. cleanser. I can't. This makes my eyes run. Can can you get? She's Jamaican or I I or from the islands. Like so, uh, she's like, uh, can you get some more of this? And it was Resolve, like uh, spray and wash. Yeah, this is the same thing, and it doesn't hurt my eyes. So I can clean the kitchen counter and everything with fucking spray and wash. I'm like, no, I d- fucking don't want everything to smell like fucking laundry. And my god, you know. What? Kill me okay. now. That's a kill me now. Where I I'm the girlfriend. fucking host! Look, yeah. one of the beautiful things about California is you're always dealing with a Spanish speaker who's cleaning your home. So there's right. a certain level of communication that will be impossible. Mm-hmm. And like that plus guilt means I just never question what Maria does. Right. Maria's ways are her own. When she, sent, when she sent my cashmere hoodie through the washer, it was a difficult day oh. for mm-hmm. both oh of us. <laughs> Because being big, they don't realize how much we treasure our clothes. They and make shoes. one cute thing for me a year, right? Like people don't right. people don't understand the big and tall men's stores are just they're only for Armenian twenty somethings and JV football coaches, and like everything is for them. And I am able to find like one adorable right. thing a year, right. and it costs too much money right and it's just not replaceable. I it's you know my son is thirteen, my younger son Ben. Yeah. And he's about six two and a half. He has a fourteen men's shoe. Is he the crazy good basketball player? And he's the crazy good basketball yeah. player. All right. So he like his shoes are tight. So he's yes. gonna be a fifteen soon. Which is we're done now. Now it's like some fucking online The internet but the internet is a beautiful place. And anytime you're in Portland, there is a great place called like Odd Size or something like that mm-hmm. that has like just options where you can go and buy stuff. But I wear a size fifteen shoe and it's um mm, you know what that may does that <laughs> let me ask you, you're gay and I need to know because only a gay guy would answer. If you have a big foot, do you have a big cock? Not necessarily. Okay. Mine's fine. Black, however, does mean what they say it does. Right. But there's also the really skinny people have like yeah, really the, big ones. The skinny guys, they always have the gigantic But do you thong. think it's because they're skinny that it looks bigger? I think so. I think so. Did I ask you? No, no. I was just talking. I like talking about oh, dicks. All right. Yeah. You, so you think. Yeah. All right. Yes. Because I, the only guy I had coitus with in mm-hmm. in college which was actually because i was with a girl you might be a lesbian was, if you call it coitus. I, I felt like see i come from the generation where i had to be with a guy to prove uh, and and let me tell you it was the most unnatural thing ever i felt like i was being raped and molested like it was just completely un. it was like if christian finnegan was with you know, because Christian's here, uh, but was with a guy, you know, and you know. anyway, so I think that that would be super hot. I know you do, but oh, we're, wait, he's what not I'm with saying a guy? Is the guy was really skinny and had a 10 inch. Oh, and oh. someone goes, well, that's why you're gay, because it was too big. And I'm like, <laughs> no, that's not why I'm gay. That's a rough. That's way what to he tells out. people. 
Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Miss Judy Gold. Here's my thing with pornography, heterosexual pornography. Those girls always just seem how they it just always feels coercive. Like it never feels like it I don't watch a lot of porn because yes. I have a very vivid imagination. Yes. But the porn I've seen, the women are shit. They're uh-huh. pieces of shit and I so I can't deal with that. The lesbian I can't I don't know. Mo- a lot of lesbies watch gay guy porn. Yes. And I think it's because they're equal partners a lot of the time. Yeah, it's the <sighs> Like, uh, I mean, one time in Portland, I have a joke about this, but one time in Portland, we went to, like, comedians went to a strip club, ha ha ha, and I was very much preparing for, like, the degree of, like, oh, this is sad, but it was, like, a cool, lovely, everyone has a master's degree about what they're doing kind of situation, Um, and it, like, female sexual objectification can be so nice if there isn't just that layer of terror and creepy on top of this. Right, right, right. Like, and the thing about, the nice thing about sexually objectifying gay guys is like, you're never going to strip away our humanity. Our world understands that men are supposed to be people. Right. Like, there's never going to be the, oh, right. she's a useless cum rack. Right. But Unless all- you're trans. <laughs> but the That's other very thing, true. Uh, we're not- Your bodies belong to all of us. That's right. You exist to be killed on an SVU. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm ready. But the guys are so, they, guys are much, it's much easier for them to have sex without emotion. Yes. You know, without feeling. And it's just a sexual act. I can't do that. I don't want to have sex with someone who I don't have feelings for. Like, I just don't want to do it. I'd rather read a great book or some New Yorker article from like three years ago that I kept because I fucking torture myself. I fundamentally, I I fundamentally do not understand why the person who's supposed to be the primary relationship in my life is the person who I have good fucking chemistry with, because that's not necessarily like I, I am both a boutique physical type and a boutique personality type. So you're either going to like, I've had to deal with so many people's boring, stupid girlfriends or boyfriends. Right. It's like, why don't I bring someone charming and amazing who I'm not having sex with? Christian, for example. Um, and then, he's not that great. And then have some, pretty cute. Have some guy who shows up to my house when things need to get taken care of and we take care of things. Now, I have my friend Dale. Uh huh. Who is my understudy in Clinton the musical, which you both have to come see. I will. Eric, are you going to come see? Eric's Eric's an amazing photographer and he's. He's here taking pictures. Yeah, that's what I just said. Right. He's he's a photographer. And I was just about to say he's here taking photos. Yes, boss. But you had to say pictures. I'm the fucking host. (laughs) Eric, is it photos or pictures? It's photographs. Photographs. We were both wrong. I did a whatever. So uh, now I forgot what I was fucking saying because I had to go up. You're understudy Dale. D- Dale. So Dale is You're 61. Hired. Okay. He has been an understudy for 40 years. He is one of the most well-respected theater, musical theater people ever. Patty Lapone puts him number one in his book, thanks him. And he said, you know, if I wasn't an understudy, I would never have had the opportunity to work with all these incredible stars in these incredible parts, right? And he's so fucking talented and so disciplined and so smart, like does the New York Times Sunday puzzle in like five seconds, yeah. right, Pen. So um, he has been with his partner for 38 years. After, um, I don't know, 20-ish, they split and they got back together. They're together 38 years. They are the primary, they are literally each other's, you know, Dale's father just died. He was there. You know, they are their primary relationship. They live on 50th Street. Dale lives in apartment uh, 6E and uh, his partner lives in apartment 5E. Oh, that's fantastic. That seems so civil. And they spent every morning, they don't sleep. He's like, I don't need to sleep. Dale's like, I don't want to sleep with anyone. Yeah. They, but they're literally go up and down the stairs. They have dinner together every night. They, everything they do, except, you know, taking a shit and whatever and going to sleep. Right. That makes it romantic. And they have the most amazing relationship. I love that. 
I think so it's great. So, of course, I tell Elisa that, right? <laughs> Uh-oh. And she, you know, everything I say, that's why it's hard to be with a woman. I have a lot of, I think I think like a male a lot of time. Uh-huh. I don't, I have, I'm fearless. Um, I never thought because I'm a woman I can't do something. My father kind of taught me that. And, you know, I've. You know, this whole female comedian, male comedian, I never, I think I was so good friends with all the guys, like on Tough Crowd. And, you know, you, you, Christian wrote on Tough Crowd, you know, and I was sort of the token girl because I never wanted to fuck them. Right. I just wanted to talk and, you know. But I think one of the things of stand up comedy is you have to, everyone must successfully be able to be a 25 year old boy in a hoodie. And, like, I'll completely yell at people for being, homophobic or misogynistic mm-hmm. or all of that but like when a little gay boy comes whining to me i'm like no you have to be able to hang you have to be able to do that if they say something you have to say something mean back to them like you oh don't- yeah absolutely well that's what you know i got teased so much and yeah. my mother told me to ignore them and literally i'm i'm not kidding it was every at least two or three times a day i couldn't even walk out of my house to get my mail without the neighbor yelling um I forgot what he used to yell. Sasquatch. Uh, no, it, well, I don't like hearing it. Like I still, the words, you know, yeah. a clod. He used to call me clod hopper. And I didn't walk by a schoolyard. I've said this before till I was in my thirties and had kids. I would literally on the Upper West Side, I would cross the street if I passed like a schoolyard. And what is his name? What's his full name? Who? The, the kid no, who did this to you. we ended up being friends. All right. There were a whole bunch. But I yeah. imagine being six feet tall from the time you were 13 also influenced the way you understand power dynamics and stuff. And also well, being gay. Right. Uh, but what I'm saying is that my, you know, my mother told me not to say, ignore them. If you pay attention to them, then you're giving them power. Right. right? So I did. I never said a word in my head. I was like, you fucking piece of shit. And I always, I had, I was lucky enough to have this mind that was like i'm gonna get out of here and i'm gonna fuck these people fuck like i just knew it right i was always shit talking mm-hmm. in my head and never right. in real life right and so i recently i have this therapist i'm going to for a couple of years who's fucking phenomenal will not take any shit from me because i've charmed the pants off of every <laughs> therapist i've had and uh and she said that was absolutely wrong of my mother to tell me to ignore them uh-huh and i don't know you know, and I still, it's just Im- incredible. The humiliation, the feeling of humiliation, that exact feeling comes back when I'm at a step and repeat, which if the listeners don't know what that is, it's if you're at a big event and, uh, you know, you, all the paparazzi are there and you stand in front of some sort of logo thing. And I often go to these big events and I step and repeat. Um, and when, the step and repeat person is like, I'm sorry, what's your name? Like, it's so humiliating. You just feel like, and I put myself as a comic in the most humility, like the probability that I'm going to be humiliated, but I don't, but I can fucking handle it because it, it was so bad, you know, nothing – I've been through it all. I've, I've performed in the shittiest places and, you know, bars and, you know, it's just – I don't know. But – Well, I mean two things. First mm-hmm. of all, my my parents always told me that I was supposed to fight. Like if somebody said something, I was supposed to hit them. Right. And I so completely did not understand that that I just completely checked out of interacting with human beings for the first 17 years of my life. But then there's also just the point of like you kind of – that – um Eleanor Roosevelt quote about like you know I play Eleanor Roosevelt and Clinton music you, you which also which one play Linda Tripp so is it yes. Ghost of Eleanor Roosevelt's well yes because you know she is really Hillary's muse yes yes there was the whole she talks to yeah Eleanor's yeah, ghost all thing. In it. yeah yeah but um just the thing of like I my f- when I started homosexuality wait was, what's the quote oh the quote is like people can only make you feel lesser with your consent right um and it like when I came out of the closet I was just I'm not pretty enough to be gay. I'm not pretty enough to be gay. And it was like terrifying and horrifying. And then just coming to that point of like, oh, just don't do that. Like, I know so many so hot guys who but get. But that's all conditioned f- in your head. Freaked out. They get freaked out going to like a pool party in West Hollywood or something like that. And I look like me. And the answer is just have a good time. Right. Like, just have a good time. Don't do that. <laughs> like, is that the album of your cover? Kind of what that is? Yes. Effable. Let yes. guys, listeners, all. 24 of you <laughs> um guy branham's uh new i say album uh-huh because 
it will always be an album to me. Yes. And that is another thing that I find to be so – it causes me sorrow. The feeling of that plastic wrap – uh-huh. And you take it apart and you open it up and it's got all this great art on it and stories. I mean, getting a new album was like unfucking ble- and you'd take it and you'd put it on your turntable and it was it was an event. You know, I got this album, you'd listen to the whole thing and yeah, you know, it sucks. I but- just I just love that I can never scratch an MP3. I don't care. I love the yeah. Whatever. Uh, effable, which is so great. You jumping into a pool with these fucking hot guys. Uh, now, when you jumped in the pool, did the water go over the top? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Um, That's fun. It's so funny because, you know, being a big person. Yes. You know, I'll be sitting. I'll meet someone sitting down. And then I get up. And it's like I'm a different person. Like, yeah. if they meet me sitting down, when I stand up. I am now a new person in their head. Right. Oh, you know, what? it's like, oh. But there's, I mean, I'm sure that there are jokes, but there's also a way that you probably get taken seriously as a woman that a, a lot of smaller women don't. We are so visual. Yeah. I right. Think. Um, yeah, I, I do. But, you know, it's definitely hurt in casting and it's yeah. helped in casting, I guess. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. But, um, you know, I auditioned for graduate school and Bill Esper told me that I was very talented, which nice. he really says. Uh, but there was no way he could cast me in anything. Oh. How, you're too tall. Which, you know, was a blessing in disguise. Of but, course, my mother fucking freaked out. Was did, gonna write. did she call him? No, but, I just went and I did, instead of graduate school, I just stand up every fucking night of my but life. But that's the beautiful thing about stand up is that acting is waiting for people to shove you through a U-shaped hole. Right. And there is not a, a, I know, I was talking a about that hole. with Susie Essman. It's like she goes, "You know, Judy, we can always work. We will yeah. always work. I won't work on Comedy Central anymore. I'm too old apparently." Right. They told me I'm not their demographic. Meanwhile, I have fucking 25-year-old guys Oh my god, you're so funny! Like, Seriously, it's unbelievable. They're going to change their minds. About I mean, that. They're, no, they're the not. weird thing is watching Comedy Central like with the commercials on. You realize like it's a machine for selling video games. Like it's behaving as though only 25 year old guys watch it. But there is something so awesome about Broad City and Amy oh, Schumer awesome. show teaching yeah. them that women can exist. Amy, I love. You know, yeah. she called me years ago. Um, she asked for my phone number because we had the same manager. And she's like, uh, he said, oh, she's a big fan of yours. And can you just talk to her? Yeah. And I did. Uh, and now she's a fucking billionaire movie star. And I'm in Queens uh, doing a podcast and I'm in an off-Broadway play. But that, but, like, but I, I love the shit she does. I love the shit. She's such a good feminist, you know, and it's awesome. I've never done five minutes on Comedy Central. And it's always funny because every year the like – the dudes who are at about my level are like, oh, you're submitting for a half hour, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, uh, it's just this weird situation of it It would sort of never cross their minds why Comedy Central was always like, eh, we don't know what to do with them. It's just ridiculous that, you know, these people who have never been on stage or done anything creative in their life tell America what entertainment, what's entertainment, right. what's drama, what's comedy. And that's the one thing, as we wrap it up, because I just got the wrap-up sign, that the web is great for. Yes. When you do something and use that and create something fantastic instead of, you know, here I am lip-syncing something in my bedroom. My mother screams at me, you know, <laughs> and now I'm a fucking billionaire. It's yes. just, you know, it's beyond. But – um I don't know. I just think for yeah. the record, Judy is not a billionaire. Being, I have one bathroom. Go ahead. If people could be, people YouTube- think I'm rich all the time. It's so funny. Well, they assume because you're so popular. Anyone who's been on TV is rich. Um, I would be really wealthy if I didn't have kids. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I would be fine. I, I do own a house. You know, you made human beings, and I would not give that up. I mean, they are you're the s- fucking greatest kids. You know, I will tell you a story that will make you. First of all, Henry. They're both straight, beyond straight. Like uh-huh. Barbara Streisand gets a gay son. I get the fucking straight. <laughs> they are beyond straight. Henry was on – I'm going to tell you two stories that are going to give you faith. Um, Henry, very athletic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Henry's an amazing catcher, baseball. And he played West Side Little League. And Very um, dreamy. 
He's really gorgeous. I'll show you a picture. He looks You'll... like a Disney prince. Yeah. Judy, and so... you don't want to show a photo of your 18-year-old son to me. I know, that's true. <laughs> so, um, you're right. Anyway. Especially not this one. Yeah, this one is. And uh, so, he's catching. And he's a tough cookie. Like, yeah. he won't put up with any shit. And some kid called him a faggot or something uh-huh. when he... he um, tagged him out at, yeah. at what i'm just like, how you, you just called a uh, son with two moms a faggot right it's just like right. how do you but even they, respond that's how to that they trash talk you know yeah. Yeah, they of course, don't know of course yeah. and then they so, hit each other's but asses he's been called a faggot because he has two yeah. you know of course and he's very violent um yeah. but he got up stopped the game and said to the coach he ran over to the coach if you're if that guy calls me a faggot again like I will fucking kick the shit out of him. Do not call me a faggot. I have two moms. They're right over there. And blah, blah. He t- All of a sudden, nice. the coach walks over to us, everyone and our team. And he says, you know what? I'm very, very sorry. I'm gay. And he came out. Wow. To the team and to us. Um, wow. And I will not put up with that. How lovely is that? That's how simple right. is that? How much does that solve that problem? And you how know? wonderful. Yep. All right. Then Ben, the 13-year-old, he's an amazing basketball player. And um, he plays – he'll play at the schoolyards. And I, I used to bring him to – I bring him to the um, – what are they? The, the courts? No, I bring him to the – Playground? The special ha- – the – YMCA? Community center? No, shut up! I bring him to the uh, projects to play because yeah. I want them to learn how to play street ball. Yeah. And then they're like, I used to play with the kids were so like, why you let your mother play? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they were great. I love those kids. Anyway, so he's playing at a school year or something. And this kid's like, yeah, you're fag, you're fag. And Ben, so he's he's the one, he came out of me, Henry came out of my ex. Uh-huh. But they're both. Yeah. And so Ben's approach was, uh, after the game, he said, went up to the kid and he said, why do you hate gay people? And the kid's like, I don't hate gay people. He said, really? Because when you words, use words like that, it makes you sound like you hate gay people. Yeah. And I have two mothers. And if you keep using those words, you know, everyone is going to think you're whatever. Yeah. And his 13 year old thing. And it was, and just to see these kids stand up for themselves and their family. Yeah. You know, like Henry's in a frat. I go, does everyone know you have two moms? Yeah, no one can. You know, he doesn't give a shit. And these kids are from, he's at University of Indiana in Bloomington. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, oh, wow. and he never would they ever. Yeah. They're probably like hot. <laughs> no, but they, you know, I don't know. Maybe it helps that I'm a comedian, but it, they don't care. You it's know? lovely. The and, younger generation. And I lo- I saw a tear come out, and I love you even more for that. Go ahead. However, like, however creepy the internet and all of these things are, there is just the thing of, like, we live in a different world. People are nicer. Like, you know, in 1963, it probably seemed unthinkable that we could, you know, live in a country that was less segregated. I really can't talk about how we fixed race while <sighs> Baltimore is still on fire. <laughs> You know, we talked about that. La- all right, then we have to wrap up. Right. But we did talk about the Baltimore thing and all this stuff going on. And, you know, why now? What, why now? And I, and I think, well, you know, there's an element of, well, this has been happening and now we can record it. Right. There's the element of that. But also, I think that these these African-American and low income and Latino, they see that we have an African-American president. Who is treated like shit by white GOP senators and Congress people and governors, and they have no respect for him. And he's the fucking president. And it's like, we can, even with this guy, you know, here, we still get, he gets fucking, tra- it's ridiculous. I, I just hope we get a, a taste of Hillary because. I think the Republican Party will be. T- I'd like to taste Hillary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they will you. be. They will be tired of having like gone after him in the way that they did. And she just, Obama showed up with like four years in the Senate. She's going to show up knowing every dead body in that town and ha- oh, having something on everybody. Is there anyone more qualified? It's it's crazy. And part of me, a little bit of me, 
is mad that America's first female president will be the appendage of a male president. Part of me right, right, right. is like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Sh- she played her own fucking game. Like she played her own fucking game back in in the fifties and sixties. Um, and what about ladies like that? But she don't want to be president. Yeah. She's just so well, they weren't allowed. Well, no, they got they got eighty five percent of the way or whatever. Right. The, th- the thing is, is like she's so fucking earned it by this point Mm -hmm. in time like it will be amazing you know like this rubio and all these people this woman was first of all a very successful lawyer and she was a republican she was brought up republican yeah and you know law school first you know first woman of arkansas whatever first lady senator uh, secretary of i mean like what the fuck more do you want yeah it's it's very it's very twice as hard to get half as far. Right. Um but it'll be I like that. It'll be fun to to see how she tears the shit up. Guy, I got to tell you something. I mean, I was excited to have you on. You have gone beyond what I Judy, thank you so much for no. this. I appreciate it a lot. Um, Do you want to ask him about his antidepressants? I'm going to f- Oh yeah, I have to ask you. Uh, this is a kill me now. Uh, are you on any antidepressants? I'm not currently on antidepressants. Um, f- law school to five years out, um, I was on Prozac. And mm-hmm. then 2005 to 2009, I was on Prozac and Wellbutrin together. Mm. Um, like I got to a place mm. w- where I felt comfortable without it. I also just wasn't doing stand-up as much when I was on the meds. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Because so I... That, puke. What? The Zoloft makes me puke. Yeah, the Zoloft <laughs> does, but... Uh, you weren't on Zolt. You were on Prozac. Yes. I've been on every one, and I've also had a major clinical nervous breakdown, depression. Uh-huh. And um, I am now on the uh, Wellbutrin, uh, Wellbutrin Paxil uh-huh. combination uh, and also Ritalin. Uh-huh. Um, cause, uh, and I mean, I'm on some – and Trazodone for sleep. And uh, I take a lot of vitamins and, you know, but – my fear, of course, is that I will have another nervous breakdown, which I do meditate, I do exercise, I do all the shit, but I'm afraid to not take them. Um, marching my way out of my big depression is like that thing I can always look back to, to like, I did that, and I can do that again, um, and it's yeah. nice to have been through it. Uh, mine was awful. I couldn't even speak. Oof. Yeah. Mine was a little bit of a... Didn't s- it? I heard a voice small about someone I'm else. still marching out, but it, I'm shaking it off. No, I, I, I was dealing with this with Lauren for a while. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I really changed my thoughts about mental illness. But, you know, look, you know, we're creative people. We live in our heads and you want to suck a head. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you get to. <laughs> I'd so. just like to go back for one moment because uh, um, we brought it up. Um, the same-sex couple study that was done yeah. last year says that generally they do better in school and there is not uh, – there's no signs of child abuse yet. Like they did You know why? Because they're wanted children. They yeah. weren't – it's not like, as I say in one they of my They tend to shows, be healthier, yeah. Yeah. No one – I didn't get drunk one night and dial up the sperm bank. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it definitely um, uh, cuts the argument that every child – Deserves a mom and dad. Right. Um, also, there's so many kids with that are brought up. What about the people in 9/11? You have to read an article I wrote in Huffington Post about okay. about when I brought Ben to get his tonsils out, and they asked who the real mother was. Go. Um, also, Jill Duggar says she didn't fuck her husband before marriage. It's Michelle Duggar. That's the mother. Jill's the fucking kid. Well, yeah. Well, Jill's. Uh, I know she, they just held hands or something. No, but I mean. Their, her, their audience is watching very closely, paying close attention, and apparently it is a thought that she did have sex beforehand because the pictures just don't add up. The baby bump and the marriage. Oh, God. Who uh, fucking You cares? wonder know what? People fuck. And nobody fucks more than towns where it's absence-only education. Right. My hometown runs on unwanted pregnancies. If they don't have kids getting unwanted pregnancies, then they don't need to get a job at 19 right. and work in the shitty, like, right. you know, the whole town Walmart dies. fields. Right. Because we're, we're burning a perfectly good comedian and VH1 host here. I don't I understand know. why... Why Christian's waiting to Christian go. Finnegan is here. We're wasting his I time. I know. <laughs> yeah, Christian's enjoying. He's on our next episode. Our celebrity audience. Which we do once a week. We never do more than one episode in one day. It's so funny that you stop by. Yeah, yeah. It's nice um, of you to stop by. 
God, you're delightful. Will you? Can we do this again? I would love to, Judy Gold. Yeah. This is. It's lovely meeting you, Lauren. But you're a fucking Same. hero from way back when. Oh, and it's lovely thank to get to know you. you. Um, you can, uh, go on, uh, at Guy Branham, G-U-Y-B-R-A-N-U-M and Guy Branham.com. Get this goddamn, uh, DVD or CD, whatever the fuck you call it. Album. Effable. Album. Effable. Guy Branham, uh, on iTunes. And Guy, you're going to come back. Yes, please. And, um, oh, I should say that I'm at, uh, at Judy Gold. Do you follow me on Twitter? Of course. At uh, Judy Gold, J-E-W. J-E-W-T-Y. I follow Elisa on Twitter. You do? Yes. Oh my God, she's going to be so happy. <laughs> uh, at uh, Judy Gold. And my Facebook is Judy Gold. Oh, Kill Me Now. Can you like my podcast page? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, like Kill Me Now. Uh, kill Me Now cast. Facebook.com slash Kill Me Now cast. Judy Gold.com. And uh, at Judy's at Judy assistant. Gold. We don't care about it, Judy's sister. Okay. Uh, Guy, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You are the best. Go be gay. And uh, everything was wonderful. I'll see you soon. Thank you for the visit. So long. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Fiscally responsible. Financial geniuses, monetary magicians. These are things people say about drivers who switch their car insurance to Progressive and save hundreds. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states or situations.